Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for today's uh, Fiber Talk webinar. Uh, I'm Rusaf Piyalong here with you from FTTH Council Asia Pacific. I hope everyone is doing uh, fine uh, in this pandemic time. Uh, today our webinar topic is how telcos can fuel growth via 5G and diversification. So in this webinar, we will present the flagship study uh, of Arthur de Little, uh, which finds a solution to these challenges, uh, which are unlocking value through asset reconfiguration in order to finance growth and transformation via 5G and diversification. So for today's webinar, uh, we have been joined by uh, Karim Taga as the keynote speaker for today. Uh, Karim is a managing partner of Arthur Dilitu, uh, Austria, and leads uh, the time practice globally. He has 24 years of experience with ADL uh, in the telecommunication area. Prior to ADL, he worked with a little uh, global telecom supplier. So without further ado, I'm handing over to uh, Karim for his uh, session. Please welcome Karim. So just uh, for the audience, if you have any queries or questions to the speaker or any other topics, so just uh, write them in, in the uh, questions box and we will try our best to discuss with the speaker. So please welcome Karim. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning for some. Uh, you're joining from different geographies. Uh, so thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, involve me and give me the space and the exposure to present our result of our flagship report. So um, this year we call it Time to Accelerate. It's been published a few weeks ago. And uh, this time, as you mentioned, um, we will focus on growth. You see that we started the journey um, in 2002 already, almost 20 years. And every year we focus on a specific area in the industry. Thanks to the interviews we run with our clients. And you see it's a global study. We cover all the geographies and we get the contribution of more than 120 interviews from CEOs and board members. Um, typically, the, the, the question we ask uh, and uh, the reflection we get back from you is very much uh, linked to the confidence in monetizing 5G. So, uh, as, as you see, not many are confident, only 28%. Um, then the question around um, the key priority uh, to grow beyond the core. Uh, if you look at all the uh, topics about network conversion, digital and agile, uh, diversification comes to number three. 39% supported that, and uh, obviously we had uh, previous reports focused on uh, network conversion, digital, and uh, agile capabilities. And last but not least, we have the question about uh, reconfiguring assets, right? And we see that 90% are ready to do so. A few years ago, it was only 10%. So it is a major shift and change in the industry, and I will explain to you in a few minutes why. So if we go further, we see that the telecom industry, in terms of uh, total return to shareholder, the index is the lowest, right? And if you look at the uh, enterprise value uh, versus uh, EBITDA, it's still a very difficult uh, industry we should be investing in. And there must be a reason. And we try to understand why is that. So the equity story is not the best for telcos, but there are some exceptions and we'll share with you in a few minutes uh, which one. So the reason is very simple. We, we are actually in a, a very, uh, attractive industry in terms of consumption, right? Traffic is growing because there is a huge demand in all the sectors, government, consumer, businesses. We all understood that the digital economy is very important for us and whatever we do, we need data and that goes on a network and that causes traffic. So that causes CapEx investment for the operator, but the revenues are not growing as fast as the CapEx requirement and the traffic explosion. Therefore, there is a pressure on the EBITDA and obviously much stronger on the free cash flow. So CapEx funding makes it difficult to pay dividends, et cetera. Now, if you look at the constraints of the operator, I hope you can see my mouse um, uh, circling here. You see that the, there are limitations in CapEx constraints with regards to uh, the ratio, right? CapEx sale ratio is roughly around um, 18 to 20%. 
for all the major players. So they, even if they want, if they see an opportunity, they cannot invest more because the um, analysts are putting a lot of pressure to make sure that um, you remain within that range and you can, are still able to uh, pay your dividends out. If you look on the right side, you see though that there are a lot of new fiber investments, uh, what we call the open uh, fiber access provider. They are financed by infrastructure funds and pension funds. And they don't understand this limitation. If there is an opportunity now you invest and even if you, it takes much longer uh, to get your ROI or basically to have your payback period, it's all fine as long as it's a sustainable long-term business they invest in tunnels, they invest in, in um, photovoltaic, they invest in many other industries, and they see fiber as a very long-term opportunity. And there you can see that the uh, ratios are not around 20s, but they are more around 100 to 1,000. So if you get access to that capital, you can deploy faster. And this is changing massively the market structure because either you can participate to this value creation and unconstrained way of deploying infrastructure, or you get into a competitive environment facing these new companies deploying their infrastructure. Now, we structure the report based exactly on these topics. So the asset reconfiguration, uh, what it means, and who is doing it, what purpose, what valuations. Then we will go to 5G as an opportunity to uh, monetize. So we see wholesale opportunity, we see B2C opportunities, we see also B2B opportunities, and we'll be focusing on those. And last but not least, I will cover a very important topic as well. Many operators are thinking of diversifying their business. They see that the current value creation in the core business is not enough to sustain the expectation and what the shareholders are expecting, and therefore they're diversifying. And we'd like to share with you what are the key success factors there and who is doing what. I hope that the sound quality is good and you can hear me. I will start with the first section on the asset reconfiguration. The first question is where to reconfigure? What are we talking about? We uh, launched this framework of telcos six or seven years ago and we believe that telcos should be steered and managed across three layers. One is around the commercial layer the brand, the uh, custom experience, the retail, et cetera. One around the product and enabling layer, right? This is a production model, I would call it. And last, the network layer, which is very much linked to the infrastructure. So you have typically legacy, fiber, data center, small cells, radio access, network, and towers. And Telco have started to isolate these different pieces and consider either separation, selling them off completely, or creating joint venture, or creating greenfield platforms to accelerate uh, the deployment. So, as I mentioned before, 90% are considering it. We have 89% going for the tower and run, 86% for legacy fixed, NGA 87%, and data center 69%, with different degree of models, whether it's a wholesale agreement or sharing active, sharing passive, carving out, and greenfield partnership. You see that um, the, the carving out and greenfield represents more than uh, 40% or 38% um, in the uh, biggest, uh, let's say, environment around the data centers and cloud infrastructure. And the lowest would be 21% uh, uh, with the tower. Now, tower, if you look at the evolution and the number of deals, towers were ahead. They started many years ago, followed now by Fiber, and you see the number of deals that started in uh, 17, 15, now 21. Many of them are coming up. Uh, legacies as well, radio access, and we expect the edge data center coming as well. So this is a stage approach. And basically we can say that Tawako deals are maturing now. Why are they doing that? Because there is a lift of this capex to sale ratio constraint, right? You can accelerate your next generation access technologies or infrastructure faster. You can increase the asset utilization because you're sharing the network with other parties typically. You're de-risking the investments, right? That has a major impact on the cost of equity. You move to the strengthen um, the wholesale business. Your value position gets much more attractive. 
there is a clear focus on the core business, which is the commercial business I was talking about, the first two layers, and another business logic with regards to the net core. And last, we can preempt some unfavorable uh, regulation if it's coming. So if you go first, you can set the rules and you can set the market. This is why many have considered these transformation proactively. Now, it's not an easy task because there are multiple ways of doing it. And you see, if you look at the every of these deals, the uh, Spark Chorus in 2011 already, so it's 10 years old, versus the latest one, 2020, you see that the carve out of assets can be fixed and pass, uh, fixed active and, and, and passive. It can be only part of the passive. We can see a combination of uh, mobile and fixed together, right? So you see at what level of um, um, asset you make the cut. Here, for instance, the spectrum is within the mobile active network. In this case, it's not. So there are multiple assets you need to make a call where you put them, right? whether you put them on the passive active or service layer. Where do you make the demarcation line? This trend is accelerating. You see here that we have three transactions that we have supported just in April. Fibercore uh, is the carve out of the um, secondary network layer of uh, Team Telecom Italia. The enterprise value of that was 7.7 7, um, billion, and we're talking here about 14.6 uh, million of um, copper related last mile infrastructure um, evolving to fiber. Same thing with Orange Poland. So these are two incumbents. We talk here about 600 million uh, CapEx investment with 1.7 ho uh, household. And here we're talking about uh, Telecom uh, T-Mobile Holland with 700 million CapEx investment. It's a new build, but the investment is mainly driven by KKR and Dutch Telecom Capital Partners with 100% ownership. And there is only a volume commitment in this case from T-Mobile Holland. So you see there are different ways. It's a challenger as well as an incumbent play, and the models are very different. Now, the big transaction that is going on right now is Telenor, a setting. They have already um, separated the company uh, six years ago, and now they're going for an infrastructure play in the region. So we have four countries that are overall involved, the mobile-only countries in blue, light blue, and the dark blue the classical incumbent infrastructure. So this is this announcement has been made already last year in July, the separation. And now, obviously, there are some interesting development uh, to carve out completely the infrastructure also for the mobile operator. Now, the key question there is, where do you put your demarcation line? What kind of uh, model do you follow in terms of um, open access? Um, you need to think about the self cannibalization if you have a strong customer base and retail and you're carving out the, the infra. Would your competitor just uh, take on uh, the competition head to head because they will be using the next generation infrastructure you will deploy? How to evaluate the legacy networks? How to manage and deal with the regulation competition law? What are the wholesale pricing mechanisms? And how do we secure the long term growth initiatives? So, a lot of questions, but as you see, we have so many deals ongoing that this is a major trend that anyone in the market should be considering. Now, let us, once we, 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 we consider these questions, right, that we need to reconfigure, uh, we need to look at what, where the value driver is there, we need to look at uh, how we can unlock uh, uh, the value creation. Let us think of what we do with the proceeds. If this happens, uh, where should we invest? And the idea is to invest, obviously, in 5G in many areas, and how we monetize it, I will come to that in a minute. So I will start with the wholesale. Um, you may recall that in one of our early reports in 5G, we said that there are five business models. You have the residential, the mobile broadband household here, clearly, clearly as an extension to uh, the fiber deployments. In certain areas, it makes sense to deploy rather fixed wireless access. Then we have the mobile broadband, the corporate uh, services, right? We're thinking of private network, we're thinking of slicing. We're talking here about verticals. It could be a, a city or, you know, where you need uh, multiple stakeholders. Think of um, the Olympic Games, you have healthcare, you have the, the media, you have uh, uh, the transportation because you need to transport the athletes, et cetera. So you, we're talking about multiple stakeholders and for that you need a platform. And last but not least, we talk here about uh, neutral host. 
the uh, classical uh, next generation infrastructure as a service play. So when we look at the classical retail business, we don't see any operator in the world covering all of these business models, right? Remember, uh, the coverage obligation, if you want to be successful in this business model, are different. And therefore, operators tend to focus in one or the other. Probably they do two or three, but never the five. And it has to do also with their geographical deployment logic. So what we're saying here is that if you are a wholesaler in 5G, you can probably address all these segments simultaneously, right? And this is the opportunity how you can create value in addition to your classical retail business. Now, let me show you why this is possible and why this makes sense today, right? The reason is clearly that now with 5G, you can separate an infrastructure. So we've seen this model in the past, network infrastructure and market facing operations. Uh, you can create a virtual logical network, 5G enabled, that enables you basically to build network for critical digital infrastructure player. It could be a railway company, it could be a media broadcast company, it could be uh, um, um, utility companies, government service, etc. So basically, these are new opportunities to drive wholesale business through joint venture in different verticals. And we see, I will show two examples here, that there are two major um, transformation we're seeing in the industry. The first one is driven by Cellnex. Cellnex is one of the biggest tower company in Europe, and they have managed to create a single point of contact building on the neutral host concept with all the mobile operators in the market and actually providing services to the railway vertical. And the deal that is now public is a 25-year concession contract they got with Network Rail to build a cellular internet mobile reception and fiber business model for 25 years. So basically, they're aggregating all the service that each of the operators is providing into one single face of the customer unit that is building from Brighton to London all the services uh, a railway company would need, which is exactly the topic I was talking about. It's building a dedicated infrastructure, moving on to a slice on a longer perspective. So that is one model as a wholesale you can think of. The next one is if I look at the broadcast, we don't know the future of DVB-T2, what is the next um, standard evolving to. However, we know that many telcos and many media companies are thinking of using 5G as a broadcast. And you know there is a new standard coming up, right, where the device will be available. And basically, you can use a spectrum either of the broadcasters or the technical broadcasters, I'm talking about broadcast like the channels, and come up with a model that leverage both strengths. The high towers you see of broadcasting with a classical radio access of a mobile operator. And MNO could provide wholesale services like for 5G broadcasting and can leverage the TV channel spectrum for this purpose. So we see partnership, it could be directly or in competition with, with broadcaster. And there are many advantages of going for broadcast technology uh, because you can offload all the data uh, from your network if um, at key events, if there is a, you know, a, a special news that everybody's in front of the TV or a football match or any key event, right? People will be watching. And actually, instead of dedicating the spectrum for channel by channel, you can use a broadcast technology. So that's another way of how uh, broadcast will evolve to an, another opportunity for wholesale. And of course, you have multiple models that are evolving right now around the neutral host. This could be in a city. This could be on different sites. Um, we see that utility companies, that uh, transportation companies with the uh, bus station, for instance, are being leveraged. Um, all the uh, signage uh, infrastructure that is there. Um, so we see that instead of putting three or four active network infrastructure on each of these small, let's say, pieces of small cells support, you can have one business model support by a neutral host operator. So the idea is if you basically 
consider the enterprise value of an integrated operator, we're talking about factor five. If we split it mechanically from a financial perspective, you can create 14% value with the commercial company, the Netco, because the valuation of the Netco are times tens, the Comco times four to five. But if you consider the wholesale business, we talk about this gray area you see on the top, where we have multiple additional business models with fixed wireless access as a wholesale, with a campus solution, neutral host, smart city, etc. So you can add a lot of value to the split you have already considered. And these are business models that are right now being financed and supported in the industry. So that gives you a new perspective on the infrastructure play, considering 5G as an enabler. Now, if I move to the next ecosystem that is quite interesting, that is evolving is media. Let me focus on uh, the, the perspective uh, of media and telco together. I believe that in, in consumer, the biggest value creation driver is linked to media. Uh, and for what you can show in the video right now, at least the sound will not come across, but I, I like to bring in a panel CEOs from different industry. You have two media CEOs in this, uh, in this panel and the CEO of, uh, of Verizon, consumer. Uh, David here is, is sharing with, with you uh, his vision on how 5G can help him to create an immersive experience thanks to the Viacom CBS network, right? It's a major media company, and they see 5G as a new way of interacting with the client. And you see a lot of state on the right side from the CEO of Sony Picture as well as Discovery. So we believe that there is an opportunity here uh, to media leaders, how they can create value thanks to 5G. On this slide, I'm supposed to show you the video of Ronan Dune, the CEO of um, Verizon Consumer Group sharing with you his vision of how in a stadium you can create a new consumer experience and actually leverage immersive technologies to create a new custom experience. And you see also SKT Telecom, you see also AT&T, all these leaders, CEO of telecom operators are believing that there is something special with media. And why is that? And also have the fantastic Red Bull experience where basically they're connecting the athletes with new technologies. You can hear here the chief innovation officer of Red Bull Media House sharing how they're revolutionizing the sharing of an event where if you like your athletes, you can experience with him uh, his pulse, his concentration level, all these metadata because it's full of, of sensors. These are lightly transmitted with the event you can watch. So it enhances dramatically the custom experience while watching an extreme sport event. Now, there are multiple technology that are leveraged by different um, players in the ecosystem, telecom operator, broadcaster, streaming platform, content producer, consumer electronic manufacturer. All these are contributing to these exceptional um, synergies between media and telecom operator. And if we look at the startup uh, scene, it's unbelievable the number of startups that are basically focusing on some pieces of this immersive new custom experience. If I look at Wave, for instance, they enable you to watch um, a live band in a music hall where you actually get immersed and integrated with the with the with the different with the singer and with the band with each of the member of the band live so it's, you're not only watching but you're actually part of them and experiencing incredible emotions real time life so you have also double me that creates from 2g to 3g formats changing completely the experience you have and this is what i'm talking about there are so many opportunities that are emerging now and we believe that with that, with the contribution of this ecosystem, you can create new feature around the content, around the user experience, the handsets, the accessories you may get, and the operations. And all that should lead telcos and media company to come up with new consumer experiences that can be monetized 
and each of the company can differentiate itself. And the revenue impact could be based on the model you follow, on the content, or on the experience on the device, quite attractive. And you see also it's followed by an interesting impact on the valuation. So what we're saying here is that if you consider monetizing 5G and you want to focus on B2C, next to wholesale, there is also strong opportunity in B2C, in particular if you link it to the media business. Now let me move on to the next part, the last part uh, of the monetization of 5G. And I'd like to come back to the B2B topic. So if I show you the corporate word, in the corporate word, you typically have a local area network. And let us think of this local area network, right? In the local area network, you have one boundary that you see here, the red one, which is a typical telecom perimeter. So the telecom operator is connected with his SD van, uh, providing all kind of backhaul and access network to the corporate. And the corporate word starts in the blue area. Now that's a LAN area. And you have the office, you have the business premises, you have the production, you have the facility management, logistics, etc. And actually, all these area, blue area, are supported by use cases to enhance the productivity, the experience of the businesses, the efficiency, and so forth. So, and this is sort of say, uh, supported or stopped by the security parameters. So in this area between the blue, uh, the, the red and the, the green area, this is where um, the business units have a role to play. So you, you need to have the chief digital officer of each of these units supporting these use cases. Now, the game changer for telco is telcos are every year negotiating or every second year or third year, depending on the contract, with the CIO and the CEO's objective is only to reduce the cost of connectivity, right? Access to data center, cloud, uh, uh, broadband access, uh, mobile access, etc. And he's only interested in squeezing the telcos. And this is why we see that this is a cost down discussion that you're having every year. Whereas if you actually focus yourself on the blue area, on the LAN, radio, the, not the one, which typically telcos are, the wide area network, you go to the LAN, which is typically a new parameter, you stop in the, in the, in the red line in the past, you can help the chief digital officers, right, to enhance value. So you're in the value up area. And in the value up, 5G can help you to enable attractive use cases that are relevant in this area. And this is why we believe that 5G mobile private network, 5G slices, edge computing are all technologies that are linked to 5G that can add the value up. And now all of a sudden, you're talking about a business opportunity and not about a cost negotiation. You have a much bigger and higher bargaining power to co-create value with your client. And this space is a huge space because every corporate has is ongoing through um, a digital transformation and they need to become more efficient and create um, support use cases that increases the different KPIs they're measured upon. Now, let me give translate this to one example. I'm taking here Telecom Austria A1 with the Vienna airport. Our slide was produced many years ago, and it's very interesting to see that some of the uh, corporates have adopted this logic and the architecture of this slide. You see that in an airport, you also can create this campus environment. You have obviously the blue light organizations, right? You have the traffic control between the um, classical service provider linked to servicing catering uh, a, a plane that is just arriving. You have the passenger, all the process around that, security and so forth. And then you have the domain of the public area where you have consumers also in the airport. And of course, in this case, what they have done, they have put edge cloud in the airport. They have put three of them. So they have three core networks that are supporting the different use cases that are required in different area. That is increasing the performance, highly secure because it's, it's a local network. It's not a wide area network highly available and reliable. Why it needs to be highly available and reliable? Because if you have an attack in the airport, 
you need to send your drones and the drones will basically simultaneously check all what is happening in certain environment and broadcast back the the information in the real time and you need to steer the drones and capture and process real time what's happening and you cannot use a wide area network that is shared with other consumers or business customers you need to have your dedicated network and this is why all these key record processes are happening on the ground and that shows you the potential in the future of mobile private network uh, edge cloud as well as slicing and what are we talking about in the mpn you have multiple industries the biggest one is manufacturing followed by transportation energy healthcare etc we're talking here of an opportunity of 60 billions for mobile private network in 2025 and for slicing in different industries of 200 billions so this is what you can do with 5g this is why we believe that telcos need to build capabilities around mobile private networks around um, slicing dedicated resources making sure that this is manageable and also build capabilities around edge computing where you require industrial edge using uh, ai machine learning um, augmented reality virtual reality uh, elements you need to master these technologies if you want to support your corporate networks so these are the three major opportunity the b2b sector i want to share with you now moving on to the last part of my presentation which is once you reconfigure your networks and got some proceeding once you have made investments and built capabilities with regards to 5G in the wholesale, B2C and B2B, you can also, and you should also, uh, dedicate enough resources to go beyond the core and diversify yourself. I think the story of diversification is very old. Many telcos have tried it already. If you look at the core, you can go to the near core, non-core, convert and new business, completely new business in different sector. And every sector, vertical, has its merit. I was showing a bit on the media already. In the healthcare, you can go very far as well in education, in the insurance, right? The, the biggest transaction we've seen right now is creating um, a full-fledged insurance business, life insurance, house insurance, etc., with partnership with financial service institution. So telcos are going up to this level. The question is, how much you can afford? Where should you go? And this is very specific from market to market, from one operator to the other, other. So we see here that telcos indeed selected area of diversification, and you see them all over the places. I will not deep dive into these cases, but I think what is important to know is that many telcos failed as well. So lack of compatibility is the major source of failure. Um, the cost structure, the go-to-market, the agility and the brand did not work out. So you need to find out what is still feasible with the business logic you have and the resource you have today. The second is also the allocation of these resources, right? If you make an investment, uh, you need to continue um, to uh, ring fence these investments because if there is an arbitrage between core and non-core, non-core always loses. And very often, after a couple of years of business, instead of reinvesting and pushing the service because you're getting into a scale-up phase, the plug is pulled and we rather do a campaign uh, to secure uh, at the end of the last quarter and, cap and, 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 uh, and uh, um, get back to basically the KPIs you measured upon, whether this is linked to the NPS, whether this is linked to churn, whether this is linked to subscriber acquisition, uh, you basically uh, make um, uh, rebalance the initial investment you have just to protect your core business instead of building something new. And the last one is uh, also the transition of your core initiative to a scalable business. How, how do you scale up? And for that, very often, you need a new recipe than the one you've been using in your core business. So what we need in order to be successful is a right level of ambition you need to think big. Telco is very bad in managing multiple small businesses. That's not their, their business. They are much more in the in this managing millions of subscribers and not a few hundred thousand. So the idea should be big. The model should enable uh, internal and external resources. 
right? And I will show some examples. The governance should be adapted to that, and you need to have a very stringent execution plan, uh, like agile, like private equity venture capital do, which is definitely not the logic of classical telcos these days. Now, what we believe is if you want to be successful, you need to also to allocate the business opportunity in different areas, in particular if it's beyond core. So some of them, you can do them in more integrative area. Um, it is organic because it's very close to the competence you have and it leverages the assets you have, whether it's brand, distribution channels, interactive channels you have on online platforms and so forth. Then you may create an internal breakthrough incubator to give more space and create a new ecosystem and suppliers and partners around that particular business, but it's still rather integrated approach. Then you have the more external ones, which are breakthrough uh, incubation, and this drives an innovation process. So every business opportunity you have, you need to think of where to allocate it to. You, 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 are you um, secure and confident to do it organically? Or it's better to have it external as a breakthrough incubator. And last but not least is acquisition that always been around. Now, the key message for you today is that there are multiple, let's say, elements you need to consider in those. And we believe that um, beyond the core is becoming imperative for telcos. Why? Because the business of co connectivity is maturing. And you need to prepare capabilities and competences, in particular in a conver conversion environment. And if it's digital, it's an infinite choice of opportunities. You need to make sure which one you follow. You need also to make sure that your new businesses are aligned with the core business and make sure that you calibrate the resources, anticipate the scale up phase ahead of time. You need to have the startup mentality and mindset. And therefore, you need to apply an agile model for that to nurture the new, select and nurture the new initiative. As I said as well, it has to be big and the governance should be following the private equity logic, very strict in sequential execution roadmap. And last but not least, um, we believe that um, it's a transformative process. And you need to think that your organization should be following rules of performance and creative innovation in a separate manner. So the challenge for corporate is to be able to drive the performance and at the same time leave enough space for creativity, innovation, and probably partner and work in a different ecosystem while you are still having one CEO and the same shareholder um, giving you the guidelines and putting his expectation. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for, the, uh, for listening to me. I tried to be very time conscious, 35 minutes, so 37 minutes, I have up to 40 minutes, and I'm very, op I'm very pleased to have the Q&A starting now. So back to you, Rajlin, I hope you, you can hear me now. Yeah. So great presentation. So really liked it. Uh, so we will now move to uh, the Q and A session for today. Uh, to the audience, if you have any que questions, just uh, post them into the questions panel in the box, and we will try our best to discuss uh, with the speaker. Uh, so. Let me uh, have a couple of questions from my side first and then uh, move to the audience. So, uh, the first question would be from my side, uh, how the developing nations uh, may solve the problem of investment for 5G as it uh, requires huge investment for 5G, uh, do you think? I think it makes sense to invest in 5G where there are the opportunities. And I think emerging markets have been um, showing tremendous opportunity beyond the telco space. So they were the one, if you look at um, 
MTN or RTL or many, many players, look at Jaya in, in India as well, doing fantastic um, breakthroughs in financial services, in health, all the, the services in remote health, think of Telenor in Bangladesh, etc. So very, very attractive services. And most of them have been built on 3G and now 4G, right? So they're sustainable. So I believe that what is important is once you reconfigure your assets, you need to secure the future of your company. And the future can be based on 5G, as we mentioned before, or on new businesses. What are the new skills you require? What kind of cloud-based service you would support your, the businesses? So probably it's a matter of priority. Where do you start first? But once the use cases become relevant, you should, of course, push 5G. And in my view, the obvious use case is clearly fixed wireless access, providing connectivity. So I will not start of thinking of um, edge cloud as a first service, probably, but I will focus on basic connectivity. We know that this has been already working with 4G. 5G gives you much more spectrum capacity. So it's not that 5G is much more efficient than 4G, but with 5G comes along a lot of spectrum, 40, 80, 100 mega, uh, um, uh, hertz, etc., which you can use for, let's say, the capacity and use it for connectivity. Uh, that would be my primary uh, step. The second one, if I look at what Jio has done in um, in India with uh, with uh, uh, 4G broadcast already, right? This is quite significant. So if this becomes a model, uh, broadcasting paradigm could be very fast adopted. In, in emerging markets as one of the major 5G services in consumer. Provided the devices uh, and the cost of the devices drops, of course, and we expect that in the next uh, two to three years. Okay, so that's great. So the next question uh, actually, uh, as it requires huge investment and uh, also we are seeing 6G uh, topic is uh, kind of, uh, rolling up as well, but uh, how much time it might take uh, in APAC region, uh, considering some of the developing plus developed nations, to penetrate to fullest uh, in the 5G technologies? Uh, do you think? Well, typically uh, you have um, seven years, seven to eight years between the standard, so 4G, 5G, 5G, uh, 6G. So uh, I would not wait for 6G because this will take uh, five years in addition to, to what we know already today. And the standard has not been specified yet. There's a lot of discussion and research around that right now. Uh, so it takes typically two to three years to, to scale the technology. So from the early adopter markets, US, um, Korea were the first, China was following. Um, I believe that now in 2021 and 22 we will expect a massive um, uptake of, of 5G and the price of, of device will come down for sure uh, in the next two to three years, as I mentioned before. So that's probably good timing. And I think uh, what is important is to secure the spectrum. So it, it, the regulation plays a very important role here that um, you can deploy 5G also in the lower band right the, the digital dividend uh, 700 band uh, if it's available if there are not interference be between the countries and for the capacity once you get really traction and a lot of service on that including fixed wireless access the the c band 3.5 gigahertz spectrum would be attractive so if the spectrum is not yet allocated it should be support provided by 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 the um, the, the countries and by the regulators um, respectively Okay, so uh, I'll, I'll start uh, taking questions from the audience side. So first question is uh, from Raj Kumar Matai. Uh, he thanked you for a nice presentation. And uh, his sure. question is, will 5G growth increase optical fiber demand? If of yes, mm -hmm. at what rate the demand is expected in the coming years? Yeah. I think the majority of the operator uh, are, are roughly 20 to 30 uh, percent connected to fiber, if I'm thinking of the towers now. Uh, the incumbents are much higher, 60, 70, and the challenger typically use microwave technology. So there is a huge debate whether microwave technology will be able to support, sustain 
the, the capacity that is required uh, by 5G. And most of the plans I know from MNOs are that they're moving fast to 5G. So we're talking about um, 70 to 80% connectivity in the next uh, two to three years. So once you have like 30% uh, um, uh, of your traffic from 4G to 5G, that's where you start to, uh, you are in a big need to uh, connect your fiber, your, your uh, um, base station to fiber. And very often uh, we see that uh, network sharing deals are supported by regulator just to secure that there is a faster deployment. Um, the costs are typically halved if you partner with a, a competitor and do a network sharing deal. And starting with the passive infrastructure, active could be the next level. But this is the right time. 5G triggers typically this joint cooperation uh, on um, on that on uh, on the um, on fiber uh, backhaul. Yeah. Uh, so next question is from Anil Pandey. Uh, he's from India. His question is uh, focusing on India situation as well. So uh, what, in your view, would be the ROI? Uh, where the use case may not be so compelling right away in the country uh, like India and the 5G spectrum could be very expensive. Yeah. I think we need to split uh, the question in two pieces. Uh, one is for corporates. So for corporates, most of the use cases we've been doing in uh, deploying uh, mobile private networks or edge cloud, etc., are are services that has been uh, covered by 4G. So you don't need 5G in 90% of the cases. However, in the future, with unguided um, uh, vehicles, etc., uh, automated guided vehicles, I mean, all that these services would require, or the drone application I was talking about before, will require very low latency, a lot of capacity. And in this case, you will start to think about the 5G roadmap. And the ROI is use case specific. So there is no generic ROI. You need to look at what are the savings, what are the cost implications, and what's the, what, what, the, what the roadmap, so to say, uh, in terms of um, when it makes sense to introduce what. Okay? When it comes to the macro environment, um, we have done multiple valuations of the spectrum. So you need to look at the added value that every operator in the market can make through 5G. You need to discount, make a discount cash flow assessment. That is one driver to see what could be the price that operator can afford to deploy the network. Remember some markets like Italy, they were the first in Europe getting access to 5G spectrum, but the auction was designed in a way to maximize the value for the government and therefore the operators spend billions in the spectrum but are not deploying because the money isn't there. So Vodafone, Telecom Italia, et cetera, are much slower than in other markets because all the money went through the spectrum. So these are the considerations that a government need to make or a regulator need to make in pricing and designing the tender. Now the other component is obviously the benchmarks. So we have benchmarks across all the countries. What is the price per megahertz? that you buy and use per pop there are multiple kpr there and there are multiple publications as well to how much the spectrum has to cost and you have historical numbers as well in the market so this needs to be adjusted so my point is the 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 grittier the operator is uh, the, the the government is the higher the price are the less uh operators will have the appetite to invest and deploy 5g so it's a trade-off for instance, in Austria, the country where I am right now, uh, we had in the past an auction that was extremely um, uh, driving the prices high, and the operator paid two billions for that, and they did not invest fast enough in the network. So what happened is that Austria fall back compared to the neighbor countries when it comes to deployments. For the last 5G auction, what they said is they will put a lower price. And for the operator who accelerate the deployment, they go faster. There is a bonus. If you put 100 million, you get 50 back 
if you deploy faster the network. So this is an incentive model, incentive mechanism to actually give the money back to the operator if there is a fast deployment. Why that? Because there is a strong economical value that is attached to 5G deployment and the government cannot win on both sides, right? Win on the economic development that is done through an investment of an operator and at the same time take his money for the spectrum. So we need to find the right balance. Of course, governments are auctioning the spectrum and the, and the spectrum belongs to every person in a country because this is, so to say, uh, a good that belongs to the country and every citizen is part of that. So in terms of, of tax levy, it makes sense because you can finance other, other things. But at the same time, it should not hinder the operator deploy infrastructure because this is also, again, good. So it's the right balance not to give away the state's goods, I would say, at the same time, not take too much out of the ecosystem, the telecom space that operators do not invest. So it's a very good question. And it's a pretty complicated, uh, let's say, way of dealing with that. This is why very often consultant gets involved in these kind of processes, strategy, as well as uh, a spectrum valuation, and also conducting all the, the tender and the process and the bidding. Okay. So I think that answered the question. So the next question is from Shah Iqbal uh, regarding uh, one point in your presentation. So growing beyond core, uh, is it a reality? Uh, if you have any example. Oh, very much so. Very much so. Uh, you see now Orange in France that has acquired one of the leading online bank and they're providing services across all the customer base. So every shop of Orange is now becoming a bank. So the consumer is, of course, buying the services online, registering and, and uh, doing all these transactions online. But actually, if he goes to a shop, he also expects the classical services, right? And this is a major transformation going on there. So we, we need to appreciate that this is a change. But you see that in many other sectors, in energy, we see that also in providing digital services to other companies. We're seeing that um, um, the, the, uh, uh, the capabilities I was talking about before in uh, big data analytics or augmented reality, these are also or media as well, right? Media production. Uh, we see all these areas that are uh, covered by all the telcos. If you look at Verizon, if you look at AT&T, if you look at... Uh, at uh, Jaya again, if you look at, at uh, Optus in Australia, all of, the, all of these companies are now diversifying. And indeed, it's a reality. Uh, think of, let's say, the connectivity is value proposition. At home, you, you, you have your Wi-Fi and probably you have your mobile broadband service at one point, you have your access, and in, in the office. And in between, you have your mobile coverage. But now, if you look at how the car industry is evolving, the car will become self-driving one day, and probably the time you will be spending in the car will be quite relevant. So why not entertaining you and why not providing you an experience or connecting you to the rest of the world? So there is a lot of business ongoing in the new way of consuming digital services in a car. And this is a completely new sector. So this is beyond the core because the mobile industry never basically thought of creating a value proposition within the car and you can think of a car with multiple screens you can think of a car that uh, is in a, in, a, in, a, in a virtual reality environment right you'll be sitting in the car but actually part of a meeting so think of the business opportunity and that requires a completely new thinking of how to create value thanks to the infrastructure but providing connectivity is not enough you need to get into the application and the platform level and that again, a completely new space of, of uh, I would call it beyond the core services. And I can go on and on, right? There are multiple, think of healthcare and so forth. Telia is a very good example for healthcare. I gave you in the presentation many examples, and this is becoming quite relevant. Yes, we talk about uh, 10 to 15% revenue, that's the aim. But remember in Africa, most of the operator have already with uh, financial services, exceeded 30% revenue today already. Mm. 
great examples. Uh, okay, so the next question is from Anil Pande. Uh, what is uh, the lowest hanging fruit or killer application for 5G? In the consumer, I believe it's it's media. Why would I buy a 5G phone uh, uh, if not uh, to get a new experience, an immersive experience? And what's the point of having more broadband? I mean, with, with 4G, we all know that we can get 20, 40 megabit per second. Uh, if I get 100, I do not know what to do more in my classical consumption with a mobile phone today. So latency, we saw that the latency is not that different than 4G for the time being, and unless you, you deploy standalone. Therefore, I believe that um, the, the, the media is very, could be very creative. Think of only online gaming uh, being part of, of something that is quite uh, um, ne network effect, so to say. If a few people start, you get much more. So look at these, these, uh, these topics, eSport as well. So these are a couple of areas I would, I would uh, consider. And the B2B start with 4G and the mobile private network. And that is a uh, good roadmap to expand to 5G use cases later. Okay, so for the time constraint, we, we cannot uh, take uh, some of the questions we received. The last question I'll read out uh, is uh, from Raj Kumar Matai. Uh, his question is regarding the digital divide. So finally, uh, will 5G solve the problem of digital divide? What do you think? 5G per se, not. I think you, you need much more than that. Uh, you need to make it affordable and accessible to the consumer. And the operator need to go to rural areas and deploy infrastructure there. So you need subsidies. You need probably network sharing deals because um, you can go to the edge and the edge of the, of the, of the cell reduces the performance. Now, if you basically have three mobile operator adding that little performance in addition, you can concentrate capacity in the network edge, and that makes it much more attractive. The value proposition becomes very powerful for the consumer living in a rural area. So you can extend the range, but not more investment, but just allowing them to cooperate and doing network sharing deal. So these are the regulatory intervention I can see. You need to use universal fund as well to stimulate the deployment. And of course, in the case of, of Austria, uh, one of the incentives you get, you pay back, you, 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 you get back the money you spend for the 5G auction if you go to rural areas. So this is a mechanism that is built in the tender process. And these are the instruments you can use to basically um, um, support the digital divide. So it's not only the technology, but all the activities around that. Make sense? I think we reach yeah. the time now, 11 in my Yes, yeah, so uh, we will conclude uh, now. So I'd, I'd really like to thank uh, today's speaker, uh, Karim Taga, for uh, being here. Uh, on behalf of FTTH Council Asia Pacific, uh, I personally would like to thank you. And thank you everyone as well uh, for your time uh, hearing today's webinar. I hope everyone enjoyed. We, we had a uh, good, good, interesting uh, future, futuristic discussions today. So I think uh, uh, we really, really thankful to everyone. So if you have any queries or questions regarding the presentation still, please write to us through uh, our email. Uh, we will share that uh, in a moment to everyone. And uh, stay tuned for our next webinars uh, through our social media pages and uh, website. So thanks again for joining us today. Uh, we'd like Thank to you. Say good, good evening, good afternoon, and good yeah. morning for all of you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank bye -bye. you for the opportunity.